Hey guys, welcome back. I have Dave Dowling, author of Steve Reeves, His Legacy in Films. We are going to be talking about Steve Reeves' film career, and I know that's a little blurry, but hey, there you go. Welcome, Dave. How are you? Doing well. Doing well, Scott. Happy New Year. Thank you. You too. I appreciate it. Dave and I have known each other for, I would say, going on 10 years or so. So this is not like a brand new introduction. He and I have known each other and communicated with each other for a while now. The purpose of the interview today is to talk about Dave Dowling and Steve Reeves' film career. So Dave, if you would, take us all the way back to the very beginning when you first learned about Steve Reeves. I'm assuming it was from the movie Hercules. Yes, yes. Nin 1959, I was uh, eight years old. Uh, got to see him with my family of seven in a drive-in movie. And then um, I didn't get to see Hercules on chain in the theater. I had to wait till it was on TV. But uh, I saw a few of his films after that. But I just stayed, stayed with it, you know. I, and it seemed like at one point in his career, he just disappeared. I thought, oh, he only made four or five films. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't the truth. So every so often, TV would bring him back, like the Trojan Horse, Goliath and Barbarians. I did see White Warrior in the theater, but I was always a big fan of his, just like all young guys of my generation. And then before Steve Reeves, did you have anybody that you looked up to, or was Steve the very first one? At that point in my life, not, no. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I heard of Kirk Douglas and, and I heard of John Wayne uh, and, and some of the others, Robert Mitchum. But I was never a big fan. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, my parents used to talk about Errol Flynn. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he was OK, but uh, Steve Reeves was different. Steve Reeves was different. Absolutely. And uh, he became my first screen hero, mm -hmm. I'd say. Okay, so why don't we fast forward to when you and George Helmer decided to write the book, Steve Reeves, His Legacy in Films. How did that all come about? Okay, well, George was publishing his uh, Steve Reeves International Society newsletter in 95. I met George uh, the following year in 96. But then it was soon after that I started writing articles on Steve's film career. But the thing that really... Um, got our attention is George and I went to the 2002 Mr. Olympia in Las Vegas. I was helping George with his booth and the, the place was mobbed and we were probably the most popular booth there. And there were many booths. Wow. And a lot of people, <laughs> and a lot of people had questions about Steve's film career. So following the event, I said to George, I said, you know, maybe we should write a book on Steve's film career. He said, it's a good idea. So that's basically how it happened. Uh, with the book took about nine or 10 months. It was hard to coordinate. George was on the West Coast and I was on the East Coast. And we went through several drafts. Uh, I had to convince George that I wanted to set up like a reference book so people didn't have to read it from front to back. And he agreed to that. But George was a wealth of information. He was my resource in addition to my talks with Steve himself. So, but that's how the book got underway. And when the book came out, believe it or not, there were four different types. There was a soft copy, black and white, a soft copy color. There was a hard cover color and there was a hard cover black and white, but that didn't last too long because it got too expensive to print. So uh, probably three quarters of when the book was available was just the soft cover black and white. Yes, and I'm very privileged to have a couple of those, and I believe, we're looking at the screen here, and it shows that it's sold out. Uh, if you still have copies, what we're going to do is put a link at the bottom of this video so that anybody out there that wants to buy a copy, and it's highly recommended, they can just go to the link. Do you have any more of these, Dave? No, I just have one copy of each for myself, and that's it. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I guess Sorry. check eBay every once in a while. So you mentioned yeah. you mentioned that you were at the 2002 Mr. Olympia. You and George, you were helping George yeah. with his Steve Reeves booth, 
and you said that that was yes. what you thought was the most popular booth at the Mr. Olympia Expo, as they call it. My question is, what was the average age of people that were coming up and asking questions about Steve Reeves? What would you say the average age was? Well, it, it was quite a range. It was okay. quite a range, but I would say it was probably more 50 and above. Mm -hmm. But there were people there that were teenagers, like 17, 18 years old. Many of the people were from outside the U.S., Europe. And they were quite familiar with his film career because he, his film career was always more popular overseas than it was in the U.S. for, for the whole term of his film career. Right. But uh, as I said, we had a very popular booth right across from us was Dave Draper, mm -hmm. Frank Zane. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they had they had good reception, but nothing like ours. Ours was really busy. What George had in the booth was a, a life size standee of Steve, a black and white. A famous pose with the bicep on the beach mm -hmm. and it was six feet tall and people would come over and they wanted their picture taken with it <laughs> okay <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh, believe it or not one of the some young italian guy wanted me to have my picture taken with this young guy and and, and i you're not going to believe this but i thought he might have thought I was an older version of Steve Reeves, even though I didn't look anything like him. Wow. Maybe, the teeth. Maybe that was it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I was kidding, George. I, I, said, I said, wait till that young guy gets home back to Italy and develops the film and sees Dave Dowling, the name <laughs> tag on my shirt. Okay. Well, so, you, know, you know what, what well, my philosophy yeah. on my philosophy on that, Dave, is that you know, Steve was so popular that anyone who was a friend or had contact with Steve, you know, people wanted to be around because they actually yes. shared time yeah. around Steve, which leads me to my next topic. Uh, in 1996, correct me if I'm wrong, you met Steve. Again, I, I owe this to George Homer. Um uh, as I said, I met I met George in the in early summer of '96, and then I got a phone call one day from a couple months later. Said Dave, Steve's being honored at the Mister America contest in Falls Church, Virginia, in the middle of September. Can you help me out? I'm going to have a booth. I said, Well, sure, sure, George. So it was about a five and a half hour drive from where I currently lived, and. Um, Sure enough, that's when I met Steve and I met his partner, Deborah. I ended up uh, chauffeuring Steve back and forth from the hotel to the event. I spent a lot of time with him. We went to dinner, uh, just a lot of time, a lot of small conversations. Mainly my conversation was about his film career. And he was mm -hmm. very generous. No question it was too, too stupid or too redundant or anything like that. But that was, it was an eye opener. And what I tell people is, they go, oh, were you really impressed with what he looked like? I said, oh, absolutely. I said, here's a 70-year-old man with a big square shoulders and a small waist. I said, but you know what I was more impressed with? His mind. He had a very quick mind, a very quick mind. He didn't miss anything. He didn't miss anything, especially over dinner. You know, uh, he. I was very impressed. He just didn't act like a 70-year-old. It was more like a 30-year-old. So, um, yeah. Yeah. So your first impression of him, your first impression of him uh, was what? Why don't you describe that a little bit? Was there that star quality? Was there some sort of aura? Was, was he just a, you know, an attractive older man that didn't really have this, you know, charisma? Or what was well, your first impression? My first impression was, uh, well, we were waiting in the lobby for him. And he came down, came out of the elevator, and I saw oh, I recognize him. I recognize him right away. And so does uh, other people in the lobby. They looked at him thinking, this is somebody, but we don't know who it is. But I thought he had, his color was great. Uh, his stride was great. His posture was fantastic. Straight up, straight up. And he just, you know, he, he had a presence about him. He had a mm. presence about him. Mm -hmm. But he did. He, he walked like a youth. He walked like a youth. He, he swung his arms freely. 
His back was very loose, but he was a gentleman. And George introduced me to him, and he looks right at you. Steve, he's got those big blue eyes that my late wife used to like. And, uh, <laughs> and he looks right at you, and he measures you, though. He measures you like, is this guy just a fan, or is this guy a person, you know? And um, no, I, I was, but I was impressed. Uh, yeah, yes, I was impressed physically with him, yes, for his age. Absolutely, absolutely. So let's fast forward then to dinner. You've told me a story before, and Dave, we don't have to record, we don't have to use this if you don't feel comfortable. But you had told me about his appetite, I believe, like the dinner <laughs> rolls or something. Do you, if you feel comfortable telling that story, <laughs> I know people would well, love to hear it from you. Sure, sure. Now, uh, when Steve sat down, he said, boy, am I hungry. And I'm saying, oh, boy, this is going to be a treat. So they brought the um, bread rolls. And Steve's big hand went for the bread rolls. It was like a crane picking up something. <laughs> Steve, Steve had huge hands. He had huge hands. And uh, I don't know how many he ate. And then we all had uh, prime rib. And Steve, George, and I, George Helmer and I, uh, we had a beer. Just one. And one thing about Steve, when he ate prime rib, he ate everything. He ate the fat, too. I did mm -hmm. not eat the fat. Mm -hmm. But the, the thing he stayed away from was dessert. We mm -hmm. had ice cream, and Steve just kind of looked at us and smiled. Yeah. He didn't have dessert. but And he's a, he was a quick eater, as I remember. He really polished his plate. Oh, that's interesting. It yeah. seems like in that... Uh... At that same time, you and Steve were talking about swordfish, and Steve had said something along the lines of, "That's a very good, you know, food," and that he tries to eat that once a week or something. Yeah. Does that sound familiar? You have a great memory. Yes. Yeah. I, I brought it up because it, I wasn't sure I was going to have the prime rib with swordfish, but you know, I wanted to be like everybody else. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, I mentioned to Steve. Uh, I said, oh, I really like swordfish. He says, well, I, I have that at least once a week. And I just said, I love it. I said, sometimes I have it over beef. And I said, the problem is, is when I put it on the, the grill, it kind of falls apart. And, this and, mm -hmm. that. and he said, well, I, I think he said, well, I don't have that problem or something like that. But yeah, mm -hmm. he, he, loved, he loved swordfish. Yep. So this was 1996. Um, yep. did, you, did you have any other meetings with Steve other than that at that time? No, that was the that was the last time. But I stayed in contact with him through his partner, Deborah, mm -hmm. through letters. Now, both uh, Deborah and Steve did not like to talk on the phone. So it was mainly we weren't doing email back in 96. As I remember, we were it was handwritten letters or, or typewritten letters. But I always stayed in contact with him and I'd send him, you know, photos for autographs or something like that. The next time I saw him was in March of uh, 98 at the okay. North Carolina, Mr. Okay. North Carolina. Uh, if I could just go back to the book for a second, the, many people gave me some good research on the book, helped me with filling some of the gaps. And Joe Matriciano was definitely one of them. Mm -hmm. Another person who was at the Falls Church thing was Lou Mezzanotti. And also uh, Steve's um, uh, official biographer, Milton Moore. Milton oh, wow. Moore a, I didn't know that. Yeah, Milton Moore had a a wealth of information about Steve and his film career. Mm -hmm. And of course, George Helmer, George had all the photos. Uh, the other thing uh, George has, and I call it Steve's, uh, Steve's film, a diary. Steve wrote personal letters to his wife on just about every film, how it was going, how the food was, how the weather was. And George has those letters. And I went through all of them. And I got a lot of good information from those letters. Wow, that's so that fascinating. Was all, that was all part of the research. It's all yeah. part of the research. 
Okay, well, I tell you what, let's get into the, uh, I think we're going to need to do a series of videos, Dave, uh, you know, ongoing, if that works for you, but let's get into uh, his book, his legacy in film. Why don't you just tell us a little bit about, um, you know, maybe maybe we go with Hercules, since that's what most people know. Well, as far as research, you know, in the print media, they've probably written more about Hercules than any of his films. And along those lines, there's a lot of information on the presenter, the person who bought the movie rights, Joseph E. Levine. Mm -hmm. So there was quite a bit of information to, be, to begin with. And George and I actually, uh, that chapter could have gone on for a while, but mm -hmm. it, it, it was just too much. But the thing about um, Steve always said, he says, I can't believe people remember me for Hercules so many years ago he says i made you know i made 15 films over there mm -hmm. and they always talk about hercules so uh you know he he was very grateful for the part but he stopped after two even though he had uh an opportunity to do a third one hercules against the gods mm -hmm. and they actually had a, a party for it at in october of 59 in rome and uh, Pietro Francesi was going to direct it. And Joseph E. Levine was going to get, get involved again. And Steve told me, he said, he told me this when I saw him uh, in, at Lake Elsinore in March of 99. He was autographing a uh, Morgan the Pirate Lobby card. And he said, oh, he said, Levine, he wanted to do a third Hercules, but I talked him into doing Morgan the Pirate first. Mm -hmm. So I said, oh, okay. And uh, so it never happened. But anyway, uh, getting back to your question, there was a, a wealth of information on Hercules. There is. I mean, there's less on Hercules Unchained. There's less on Morgan the Pirate and so on and so forth. But mm -hmm. he's known as the first Hercules. Right. And, and the best. you probably know the story behind it. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. He, Where the, the little girl discovered only... him. Well, you know, there's... Uh... <laughs> There's different stories about that. The, the story goes, and, you know, I always question some of the stuff in print media, especially Steve's quotes, because what he told me personally is not what matches up in some of the print media. But anyway, um, I'm going on what uh, Milton Moore told me. Milton Moore, when he was writing his biography on Steve, one of a kind, he actually went to Italy and he interviewed Pietro Francesi, the director. Mm hmm. And Francesi said he first heard of Steve in the muscle magazines. It wasn't Athena. Hmm. So it was after that, you know, he went on his daughter's request. He went to the theater and he got to see, you know, what Steve looked like other than a magazine. Mm -hmm. And that's how it happened. But he first became aware of Steve in the muscle magazine. So he had him in mind anyway. Okay. So we yeah. were all under the impression that, his daughter saw Steve in the movie Athena, went home and said, hey, daddy, I found your Hercules. But sounds like that's not completely true. Interesting. Well, it, I mean, that part could be true, but there was more I, to it. The director, I think, was aware of Steve before okay. Athena. Yeah, that's, that's all I'm saying. The, OK, the, the sequence. That's all. And the other thing about uh, what Milton said because uh, he has some quotes from the director in his book. And he said he had a translator because Francesi couldn't speak English. Mm -hmm. And he would, anytime he mentioned Steve's name to the director, the director just lit up with glee. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Big smile on his face and he'd go <laughs> on and on and on about Steve. And, and then the translator would say, oh, uh, Pietro likes Steve a lot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, he can't, they would summarize it so quickly. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, but yeah, uh, Milton was always disappointed in that. He wanted to know what was he talking about. He's going on and on. And right, on. So, right. Because yeah. yeah. we're all hanging on every word. We want to know the whole thing, not just right. the right. yeah the one sentence or something. So one question that a fan of Steve's had asked is Steve's training, and I know that's not really your deal you i'm just going to take a chance um do you know uh did steve ever talk about how he trained with weights and how he stayed in shape did he do a lot of training during hercules well, 
he said he didn't have a a good gym to go to, mm-hmm. but he had his his dumbbells. And I don't know if they're 75 pound or maybe he had a series of them, maybe 50, 75, 25. And that's what he, he worked out with to keep his body in shape. And he said he did it for a full month and did a lot of walking and stuff like that. No jogging. Steve wasn't in the jogging. He thought it was bad for the knees. Mm-hmm. And he was, he was right. But also, it's, it, he gave the impression that, okay, I trained for a month for a film, and I did it once a year, and that was it. Well, not technically, because I talked to Gordon Scott in the summer of 2006. And as you know, he was his co-star in Duel of the Titans, also known as the Romulus right. and Venus. Mm-hmm. And I actually saw a picture one time, and I saw a barbell in the background. And I asked Gordon about that. I said, did you guys work out on a set? He said, absolutely. Absolutely, Hmm. we did. Mm -hmm. He said, we had to. He said, because we had to look the same in the beginning of the film as we did in the end. And they never shot in sequence. So we couldn't take that that chance. That's a great point. It wasn't a full body workout. But what the scene required, yeah, they would go work out, get pumped up. And then they shoot the scene. All right, Dave, how about this? Are there any myths about Steve Reeves' film career? Yes. <laughs> and uh, it, <laughs> it, it, and that, this is why I really appreciated talking to Steve myself. I got the real answer. And I just think some of the things in print media are either exaggerated or they heard it the wrong way. Number one, did Steve lift Primo Carnera and Hercules Unchained. No. I asked Steve that in North Carolina in March of 1998. Uh, mm-hmm. I said, Steve, how about Primo Carnera? Did, did you lift him? He says, with a little help from my friends. He hmm. said the technicians put him on his shoulders. And he said, then Primo told him, actually, here's how you want to grip me, to balance me correctly. Because mm-hmm. Steve did walk him up that hill in mm-hmm. the movie. Okay, but but and if you watch Hercules Unchained, there's no lift. You see Steve go down, grab his legs, and the next scene, he's on. He's got him up here. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, the other thing is, what uh, some say there was never a soundtrack recorded during his films. No, there was. There was always a soundtrack. Some of the uh, pictures you see, you see the boom mic overhead. Mm-hmm. Okay. But no, there was a soundtrack. Um, What's the other thing? Uh, oh, yeah, the um, the role in Samson and Delilah. That was true, that Steve didn't um, lose enough weight in a short amount of weeks or something that DeMille wanted, and that's why he lost the role. But he also lost the role because DeMille wasn't happy with the rushes, the screen tests and stuff like that that he, that he saw. He really wasn't comfortable with Steve, so that's why I went to, with Victor Mature. So mm-hmm. it was really a combo. Steve was too, still too heavy, and he wasn't the actor that DeMille was looking for. I think Steve Reeves films could have been much more popular, even to this day, mm-hmm. if they never dubbed his voice. I think Joseph E. Levine made a big mistake. He, he, saw, he listened to the soundtrack of Hercules, and he said, I don't like his voice. Sometimes it seems too high. I just don't like it. So he tried this one, one guy... Uh, Brett Morrison uh, to dub his voice and he didn't like his voice. And this is all done in New York city at Titra sound studios, which is extinct today. Mm -hmm. And they hired a guy from, uh, he's a voice actor, George, uh, golden. I can't pronounce his name. G O N N E A U. They hired him, hired Steve. Okay. And I think he ended up doing seven of Steve's films, but the problem was, the voice wasn't consistent from film to film. No. And a good example is if you watch Santa Ken the Great, and then you watch the sequel, Pirates of the Seven Seas, there's two different voices. If you watch The White Warrior, it's not the same voice as Hercules Unchained or, or Hercules. Mm-hmm. But, but he did about seven films, and I think that was a mistake. I mean, can you imagine if Clint Eastwood, in his three, in the trilogy he made over in Italy, you know, fistful of dollars, few dollars more, good, bad, and the ugly. If his voice changed from film to film, no, I don't that think it would go well. So right. I think it, his films lost credibility, and, and sometimes the dubbing, especially in White Warrior, was not very good. Mm-hmm.
Interesting. So, well, thanks for sharing yeah. that. Steve was quoted in, in the print media many times that he was the only one speaking English on the set mm -hmm. right. other than the script, script person who guided him. Right. This lady, Barbara Bush or something like that. Well, that wasn't mm. true because Steve even told me, he says, oh, no, he says off camera, quite a few actors spoke broken English. But in the film, they spoke their own language. Mm -hmm. Now, here's an interesting tidbit as far as uh, director Andre de Toth, an Amer a Hungarian, but he lived in America. And Steve liked working for Andre de Toth and Morgan the Pirate. Andre, he said, I didn't post sync. In other words, I didn't dub. What he wanted, like for Steve, when Steve was speaking to somebody and you couldn't see the actor across from him, that person, whether it was the actor or actress or a substitute, they spoke English to Steve because they, he wanted Steve's reaction mm -hmm. from the person speaking English. Mm -hmm. And that's the way Andre A.G. Toth filmed it. But the other films, they didn't do it that way. Steve was hmm. listening to, you know, Italian, Spanish, French, Serbian, so on and so forth. Wow. So, Fascinating. I would love to have you on again and just continue on through, you know, some of the other movies and um, talk about, you know, the Clint Eastwood deal and the James Bond deal that he didn't take and just other yeah. little tidbits that you might have, you know. Oh, in I, your... got, I have some. <laughs> oh, I'm sure you do. Uh, all right. Well, we're going to wrap it up. Dave, anything else you want to say before we uh, finish? Uh, no, I will say, and I think you this is true. I read it in the media that Steve uh, really wasn't crazy about acting. And he found it very stressful. Plus, he was injured, as you know, in Last Days mm. of Pompeii. Right. And he, car he carried that with him, you know, two thirds of his movie career. Mm -hmm. um, again, I, I think we would appreciate his films more if there was a consistent voice. And also, the problem was when Hercules came here, in 59 into the u.s in summer 59 steve had already completed four films and was wrapping up last days of pompeii mm -hmm. so these uh movie studios and stuff they were buying these steve reese films and and steve released eight films in the u.s in 24 months wow so you you have to think well the credibility's got to hurt Right. You know, what, what, what are these all B films or something, you know? Right. And they and they ended up in drive in movies and some of them weren't even released in the theater. So, you know, it was too bad. It was it could have been done differently. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So do you think there will ever be another uh, person of, you know, Steve Reeves stature? We talk about, you know, how sharp he was, what an innovator he was in the gym and with nutrition and with his, you know, with his horses and with his cattle and with his acting. Do you think there'll ever be another Steve Reeves or did they break the mold? No, I think <laughs> there was only one Steve Reeves. He was such a high achiever. He didn't care about stardom. He, you know, he he was different. He was a different kind of celebrity. And, and acting to him was a means to an end. It was a job. Um, it, it paid well. And he always said, I would have never gone into films if I could have made a good a living in, in the health business. Right. You know, back then, they didn't endorse products like they do mm -hmm. today. Yeah. He would have never gone to Italy. Never gone to Italy. But, you know, overall, no, just the way beyond his films, the way Steve was, he was a great person. He was honest. He was forthright. Uh, as I said, a high achiever, very ambitious. And he expected that from other people too. Uh, mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, don't, don't idolize. Don't do that stuff like that. You, God gave you a body and a mind, make the best of it. Right. So his attitude, his attitude was different and it's rare today. And so at his uh, top, he was making like 250,000 per picture and I did a quick Google, and it said that in today's money, that had been two and a half million dollars. So he was making some really good money in those in, in the you know fifties uh, oh, and sixties. No, he, he he was, and 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 I th you know the story. He was only paid ten thousand for Hercules and Hercules right. and Chain. He right. had no idea how well Hercules was doing when he signed on to do right. Hercules and Chain. Right. And then, and then in the nineties, there was a at and T commercial, and they use like a two-second clip of him pulling the uh, pillars down in Hercules. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the theme was stretching the limits, and they showed Steve 
Well, Steve contacted them and they gave him twelve thousand dollars for that spot. So he which made was more, more, <laughs> <laughs> more than he made from Hercules. Yeah, they they gave him a hard time too. They said, "Well, your your movie's in the public domain." He said, "But not my image. Not my yeah. image. You, you yeah. got me up there on the screen." So they gave him twelve grand. Even though there'll never be another Steve Reeves, what I love about social media is that we can continue to spread, uh, you know. Steve Reeves' story, talking about you know the the physique, talking about the mindset, talking about the nutrition, talking about his movie career and what a high integrity individual he was. So you know, thank you for pitching in and helping. I hear from young people all the time who are just discovering Steve, and I think we're really onto something, Dave. If we can continue, you know, to talk about Steve, and and you know, maybe we can make a difference in some people's lives and give them somebody else to look up to. So thank you for helping with that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that was George Helmer's goal all along. Uh, as I said, you know, George balancing a personal life with family. He had a full-time job. He started the Steve Reeves International Society. It was just to get the word out there about Steve. It wasn't to make any money. And believe me, George didn't, didn't make any money. He put a lot of money of his own in starting that, but I'm sure that was his goal to get the word out there about Steve Reeves. And what you're doing here is doing the same thing. Well, thank you. I appreciate so it. Thanks. I, I couldn't do this without people like you and, you know, Randy Maloney and Barry and Eric Moore and Joe Vitale and George Helmer and Joseph. And the list just goes on and on. Uh, you know, Steve's been gone for almost 24 years now, and he's still you know, has made such a huge impact um, in, oh, in yeah. people's lives. Yeah. So it's just a really fun, That's... it's a fun uh, journey to be a part of, you know, and I know you feel the same mm -hmm. way too. Um, he just, there's only oh, going to yeah. be one, it... one Steve Reeves. So, you know, we might as well just continue to, to share our memories and, um, you know, bring other people into the journey with us. Right. Right. Hey, uh, one one thing, one trivia. Do you know what the title of my book was originally? Or, or my, our book, George and, and I? It wasn't uh, His Legacy in Films. <laughs> I'm was, trying to think, but I have no idea. From Barbe <laughs> well, it was Steve Reeves from Barbells to Box Office. That was the original title. <laughs> Well, I like that too. That has a nice ring to it. Nothing wrong with yeah. that. No, 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 no. It's, it's been my pleasure. And uh, we'll do it again. Do it again. And if people want to contact me, you could, you have my email. Uh, remember, uh, I, I know I sent it to you. I could text it to you again if they want. I have it. Yeah, I have, have it. Any, have any questions or whatever. You and, got it. Uh, be, be happy to do it again and again and whatever. But uh, no, there's a lot to his film career. A lot to his film career. So. Yeah, there really is. It's hard to just, you know, take 45 minutes and try to get it all in because there's so many little, you know, wormholes that you find yourself going down. And then you bring up something new to me that I had not heard. And then I need to know more about that. So then that's another 15 minutes or something like that. Well, Dave, thanks for being here with us today. Uh, happy New Year and happy birthday. And uh, guys, thanks for watching. And uh, we will see you next time. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Scott.